But if you know the principles of operation, you can tackle most any job and come out okay. Phil, you got to know the specs and the how-to for the job. Well, guys, is this a private Donny Brook or can I get in? You're in, Tech. I say the fellow who knows principles. And I say how to do it is what counts. Okay, you're both right. Principles, how to do it, and something else. When to do it. Huh? huh? Tech's right, fellas. And I'd say when to do it is very important. Particularly when you're talking about major repairs. Now, uh, today, we're going to discuss changes in procedures we may run across with the manual and torque flight transmissions. I still don't get the when to. Okay, take this three-speed manual transmission. Yeah? There's been some changes in it. Let's see. Starting with the K-series transmission, a gear shift housing with interlocks in the housing instead of the case is used. And there's a different linkage set up. Yeah, and incidentally, the same linkage adjustment procedures apply to the new L-series transmissions. We'll mention this transmission later. Procedures. See, Phil, there's the how-to. Yeah, but now for the when-to. No transmission, manual or automatic, should be removed from the vehicle until all external checks, linkage, fluid level, pressures have been made. Remember, good diagnosis will often save a lot of unnecessary work. Uh, let's start with the manual transmission. Yeah, Phil, you've been around long enough to know the three most common conditions we run across. Sure, low. Hard gear shifting from neutral to low or reverse. Hard gear shifting neutral to second gear. And jumping out of second or high gear. Okay, Phil, put your principles to work and tell us what might give you this condition. Hard shifting from neutral to low or reverse. Principles, schmincibles. Well, we know you can't shift easily if the gears have a power load on them or there's any interlock interference. So the clutch linkage comes first. Everybody knows that. Okay, Al, what's the clutch pedal travel? Well, you know, enough to make it. Wise guy, huh? The clutch pedal should be the same height as the brake pedal. This will give the pedal a travel of about six inches. Uh, interference between the clutch pedal and the clutch pedal rod may reduce the total pedal travel. You can spring the pedal mounting bracket slightly to clear the rod. Uh, what's next, Phil? Check and adjust the clutch pedal free play at the clutch release fork rod. This should be 5 30 seconds inch, measured at the clutch release fork pin. You can also measure this between the adjusting nut and the tubular portion of the rod. 5 30 seconds there, I'll give you one inch of free pedal movement at the pedal pad. Say, Al, suppose a customer wanted the clutch to release with less pedal travel. What would you do? <laughs> well, uh, call Phil over and let him work on it. Maybe with a linkage stretcher. Very funny. Well, Al, there is a new shorter clutch rod and a new clutch torque shaft with a longer lever on the tube at the clutch end. It won't stretch linkage, but it will give a quicker releasing clutch action for those who want it. Actually, there are two new clutch torque shafts used on the L-Series. One is for standard models, the other is for the high-performance models. Identification of each is given in the reference book. Good. Now, what would you do if the lady of the house couldn't shift gears without clashing? That could indicate there was too much pedal pressure for the little woman, couldn't it? Yes, it sure could. So you check the over-center spring adjustment. First, you loosen the adjusting nut until the pedal drops to the floor. Next, tighten the adjusting nut against the spring bracket five full turns for six-cylinder models, seven turns for eight-cylinder models to raise the pedal. Then, check the pedal action. If the owner likes heavier pressure, loosen the nut one additional turn. Tighten it one turn if he likes lighter pressure. A standard setup calls for 30 to 32 pounds pressure at the pedal pad. Now, with a proper clutch adjustment and a fully releasing clutch, what would be the next thing to check if you still had trouble shifting? Gear shift linkage. Right. What's the first step? Well, I'd check for binding in neutral by raising the lever several times and releasing it. The lever should return to its normal, fully released position. 
If the lever binds and won't return to the released position, I'd look for gear shift rod binding at the duffy pad and floor pan and at the column jacket bracket at the instrument panel and at the upper and lower rod supports. Okay, Phil, what's next? Well, let's see. I'd place the transmission in neutral and walk around to the rear of the car. And jump up and down on the bumper. <laughs> Hold on, Al. You sight through the rear window or over the end of the lever and knob to a horizontal section of the instrument panel to make sure the center line of the gear shift lever knob is in a horizontal plane. Now, if it isn't, you'd bring the knob to horizontal by adjusting the length of the second high control rod at its swivel. That's the swivel on the lower rod. Back off the two adjusting nuts, then adjust the nuts up or down on the rod to correctly position the knob. Finally, tighten both nuts securely against the swivel. To about 70 inch pounds torque. The crossover movement of the lever from the second high side to the low reverse side should be accomplished without binding or interference too. Now, if the slots and the levers are not aligned, you can feel the gear shift tube pin striking a corner of the slot when it's moving through crossover. To bring the slots into line, adjust the low reverse rod, the upper one, by adjusting the two nuts at the swivel so the gear shift tube pin can be moved up and down through crossover without interference. And there's one more thing. The gear shift lever should have equal crossover direction free play in high and low positions. Uh, know how to make this adjustment? Well, you'd have to move something. Hey, I know that one, Tech. The lower support can be moved slightly up or down the length of the steering column to properly position the pin and obtain the correct free play. Right. You loosen the two lower support clamp bolts on early models or the single clamp on later models. And you tap the support up or down to the right position. This will also ensure a proper steering wheel to shift lever clearance. Then you tighten the clamp bolts to the specifications for the model you're working on. Okay, Phil, what was the second condition? Hard shifting into second gear. How about that, Lou? Well, it could be the interlock in the gear shift housing blocking the shift. So make a careful check and adjustment of the gear shift linkage first. Pay special attention to the crossover adjustment. Uh, if this doesn't correct it, then we qualify for the when to you were wondering about. Remove the transmission. In looking for internal damage, inspect the synchronizer parts carefully. And particular attention should be given to the clutch, gear, and stop rings. Let's see, there was something about the stop ring pins. Yeah, that's right. The pins must be straight and tight in the rings. Replace the rings if the pins are not straight or if they're loose in the rings. And when assembling the synchronizer, use the new, thinner, lighter load stop ring spring. This new spring improves shifting into second and prolongs synchronizer life. Uh, speaking of prolonging life, somebody better turn the record over. There's no more life left on this side. Now, uh, we were talking about installing the new stop ring spring. Another point. When reassembling the transmission, always check the second gear end play. It should be from three to eight thousands. More than that might let it jump out of mesh or be noisy. Uh, speaking of noise, how about that main shaft roller bearing at the front of the extension housing? That sometimes causes a noise that can be heard at all speeds in all years. Yeah, that's right. And if you have to install a new bearing in the housing, be sure the lettered end is facing up. Press it into position very carefully. It must be flush and square with the end of the housing when installed. Now, Phil, what was the third condition we mentioned? Jumping out of second or high gear. But that might be for several reasons. Yeah, that's right. So the thing to do is to eliminate the possibilities, starting with an inspection for worn linkage and a linkage adjustment. If the gears are not completely engaged when shifted or the teeth are worn, they won't stay in mesh when torque is applied. Now, if that doesn't do the trick, the next step would be to check transmission alignment. Any misalignment between the clutch housing and the transmission case can cause this trouble. Now, first, you'd remove the transmission and clutch. Then, 
mount an arbor and dial indicator on the flywheel and check the clutch housing bore and face runout. Begin with the indicator arm contacting the bore. Now, as you rotate the flywheel, read the amount of runout as shown on the dial. Over four thousandths inch indicates correction is required. Now, how would you do it, Phil? I'd shift the housing one half the total indicator reading. One half? Sure. If you shifted it all the way, you'd be changing the position of the runout, not correcting it. Yeah, that's right. You mark the amount and direction of bore runout. Next, position the indicator further out on the arbor with the arm of the indicator against the face of the housing. Turn the flywheel and read face runout. Now, what's allowable here, Phil? Mm, three thousandths total. Good boy. Now, to correct excessive bore runout, install offset dowels in the engine block. They're available in seven, 14, and 21 thousandths offset. To correct face runout, install shims of proper thickness between the clutch housing and the engine block. If both bore and face runout are excessive, Make both offset dowel and shim corrections at the same time. Then recheck to be sure you've brought the housing within limits. Now these checks are important and must be made carefully. Transmission parts replacement is not the answer when the condition is caused by misalignment. Uh, while the transmission is removed, it's advisable to examine the teeth on the synchronizer clutch gear, the second speed gear, and the main drive pinion. If any teeth are damaged, the gear should be replaced. This new clutch gear, identified by two grooves instead of the former single groove, should be installed with any new parts. The new gear can be used in all transmissions using the pin type synchronizer. K and L series cars use one synchronizer unit. Earlier models use a different unit. The only difference is the outside diameter of the clutch sleeve. Yeah, and another point to remember. If the synchronizer clutch gear only is replaced, use the new lighter load synchronizer stop ring spring. Then recheck second speed gear end play to be sure it's within three to eight thousandths. Now, Lou, how about the new three speed manual transmission? Yeah, that's a good point, Tech. This new transmission entered production early in the L series schedule. Well, can you tell it from the other one? Oh, yes. Externally, it can be identified by the full web between the lever bosses on the gear shift housing. And the gear shift operating levers are the same length as the earlier series, but are of slightly different shape. The transmission case is new, but it resembles the past model. Now, in addition, the two gear shift rod levers at the lower end of the steering column are now of equal length and slightly different shape than formerly. How about inside? The low and reverse sliding gear is wider, and the reverse, low, and second gear ratios are different in the unit used with the V8 engine. The gear shift linkage is new, but the adjusting procedure is the same as with the former models. Is the same transmission used on the 6 and the 8? Oh, no. There are two models of this new transmission, one for the six-cylinder engine, one for the V8s. You'll find the reference book covers the manual transmission changes and procedures we've talked about. And, since we're getting up to date on transmissions generally, let's include the torque flight transmission. I'm interested in that. Oh, good, Phil. And let me emphasize the fact that the changes we're going to mention necessitate slight changes in certain adjustment procedures. And remember this. When you make the push-button cable adjustment, have someone hold the R button all the way in. That removes all the free play at the push button box. And let me repeat, if you do these things first in the proper way, there'll be less need for removing the transmission from the car. Al and I'll make sure about those checks. That's good. The first change concerns the use of a new reverse servo spring and retainer. These parts provide a better alignment of the servo piston and prevent it from cocking over and causing a no-reverse condition. Transmissions using these parts have the letter J, or letters following J, stamped on the right side pan rail of the case. You can install these parts whenever a transmission is disassembled for service. 
A series of changes were made to reduce clutch slippage and prolong front clutch life. Uh, tell them about it, Lou. Yeah, will do, Tech. To improve idle and low speed line pressure, the position of the front and the rear pump check valve in the regulator valve body was changed to put the small bleed orifice inward against the front pump pressure port. This change became effective with transmission serial number 547,000. Now, in servicing a unit of a lower serial number, make sure the valve is installed with the orifice facing the front pump pressure port. Later transmissions use a check valve without a bleed orifice so it can be installed either way. Another change is a new wider front pump providing greater capacity at idle. This prevents premature wear of the front clutch discs due to low pressure. The new pump went into production with transmission serial number 587,523. The letter L, or letters following L, stamped on the right side pan rail, identify units with the new pump. It's interchangeable with the former pump, but only as a complete assembly. Right, Tech. And in line with changes, to prevent slippage and improve clutch life, a new friction material is being used on the driving discs of the front clutch. Uh, tell the boys about the rear clutch pressure plate used to check front clutch clearance, Lou. Well, the rear clutch pressure plate that was recommended to be used in checking the front clutch clearance is no longer used. The new production plate cannot be used because of a difference in the spline diameter, but you can use the truck transmission rear clutch pressure plate as a checking tool. Have you any new information on rear clutch clearance? Well, nothing special, Tech. The clearance is usually right if the correct number of plates and discs are installed. But there's a checking procedure in the reference book if you need it. Good. And there's more information concerning transmission changes in the reference book, fellas. Read it carefully. It'll help you do a better job in servicing transmissions because good service is up-to-date service. And keeping up-to-date is up to you. Thank <laughs> you.